My name is Michael Cabada. I'm a mechanical engineering senior. I'm the team lead of this project, as well as the roles of CAD design, finite element analysis, and manufacturing. My name is Trevor Necht. I'm a senior studying mechanical engineering at UCF. I was primarily responsible for purchasing and part acquisition. My name is Casey Kalinguski. I am a senior in mechanical engineering, and I was involved with actuation system design and VNV processes. My name is James McAllister. I'm a senior in mechanical engineering, and I'm the testing and manufacturing lead. My name is Jethro Rafael Suarez. I am a senior studying mechanical engineering, and I was involved with system programming, and I oversaw actuation system design. My name is Alan Tucker. I'm a senior mechanical engineering student. I am the lead system programmer, and I assisted in CAD, circuit integration, and manufacturing. And we are the adjustable prosthetic socket team. The intent of our project was to mitigate a major cause of pain and discomfort for prosthetic users, which is the improper fitting of the hard socket on the user's residual limb. The residual limb changes shape throughout the day as the muscles adjust and volume changes. The solution we devised was the design of a socket which self-adjusts the pressures inside of the socket based on the changes in the patient's residual limb volume. We wanted it to be able to automatically adjust to the patient's anatomy so that there would always be a firm but comfortable interface between the residual limb and the socket. Additionally, we wanted the socket to facilitate good hygiene, durability, compatibility with common prosthetic parts on the market, and show compliance with the related industry and medical standards. Our sponsors for this project were Dr. Powell, Dr. Soto Toro, and the National Institute of Health. Successful implementation of our design would help amputees by preventing the feelings of over-tightening or loosening of their prosthetic socket. This design would improve the amputee's quality of life by preventing the need to self-adjust their prosthetic socket in normal day-to-day -day activities. Although our actuation system is used for transtibial or below-knee amputees, this actuation system can also be used for upper limb amputees. Completion of this project would help our sponsors, mainly Dr. Powell, as well as the National Institute of Health in their endeavors to use engineering to aid those in rehabilitation. Although our actuation system and design is not made for the market as of yet, it can serve as the basis for future self-adjusting prosthetic sockets. Project testing ranged from computer simulation to physical testing. The appropriate medical and industry standards were the foundation of our test plan. These standards outlined compression, fatigue, thermal, and freefall tests, and required outcomes of each. We proved compliance through creating finite element analyses of each test scenario with ANSYS software. Once the socket design was theoretically able to withstand these tests to the degree required by the medical and industry standards, we opted to have the socket produced via 3D printing. The electronics were developed by first isolating the different systems we needed to develop across several Arduino microcontrollers, each for dedicated group members to code respective programs for. The physical testing of our products focused on the overall requirement of our project, successful actuation. When the socket was fully constructed, we tested the response for each bladder to the inputs read by the respective pressure sensors. There are three aspects to how our system works. First are the sensors, then the servo motor actuation, and then the pump activation. The sensors are placed between the bladder and the socket wall, such that when the residual limb pushes against the bladder, they'll push against the socket wall. The sensors will record this value in analog inputs and send that to the Arduino. And based on the percentage between 0 and the max analog value of 1023, the Arduino will calculate the voltage between 0 and 5 volts, the 5 volts being the amount of voltage that the Arduino runs through the FSR sensors. For instance, if the analog value input is about 60% of the 1023 max analog input, then the Arduino will calculate the 60% of the voltage between 0 and 5 volts, which is 3 volts. Using the voltage divider equation, we can then find the resistance. Using the calibration curve, we will need to find conductance, which is 1 over the resistance, and we can find the force value from this calibration curve. Then we had to determine a Goldilocks zone of pressure values for each sensor. The bladders, and therefore the sensors, are spaced at 120 degree angles from each other. These locations correspond to the medial flare, patellar tendon, and popliteal regions. The prior research determined comfortable values for each region. However, we were not able to actuate based off of these values, and instead, for working purposes of actuation, we had to reduce the pressure 
to about three and a half newtons to four and a half newtons being recorded from the sensors. Valve actuation happens per bladder. So while pressure values within the sensors are within the Goldilocks zone, we will close the bladder, which means that we will let no air in and no air will come out. When the pressure values are below the Goldilocks zone, we let air in, but no air comes out. And when the pressure values are above the Goldilocks zone, we let air out, but no air in. The pump activation happens overall with the system. When the pressure value for at least one sensor is low, the motor is on, even if other bladders have too much pressure or are in the Goldilocks zone. However, when all pressure values for the sensors are in or above the Goldilocks zone, the motor turns off. And for the power supply of the entire system, the sensors are connected to the Arduino 5 volt pin out, and the servos and pump are connected to two 9 volt alkaline batteries in series, which creates 18 volts in total. So in order to address the issue of not being able to meet in person, we had Zoom meetings at least once a week. In the early design process, this was really easy and not that different from a normal design process because most of it was paperwork, research, designing. Also, it was a little more convenient to be able to have remote classes or hybrid classes where lecture recordings were available after the fact because it made us more flexible in our schedules and more able to have meetings whenever we wanted. Having a Zoom meeting is really convenient and really easy. As this field of research is still early in development, current prototypes are limited to the laboratory environment. This made formulating and design to address the problem incredibly challenging, but also exciting. During the design phase, we had difficulty accurately gauging the compatibility of parts, as well as exactly how suitable each part was for our needs. Part acquisition was also troublesome. For instance, when we went to pick up our socket from the machine shop at UCF, we were informed that we could not leave with the socket because payment never went through, even though all the necessary information was given. This delay in component retrieval resulted in a delay in project status. Our team is very invested in the successful completion of this project. Several of us, myself included, either have a disability or have a close family member with one. The opportunity that this project provides us to be able to potentially create something that improves the lives of those less fortunate than us is something that really motivates us to get us through completion of this project uh, in spite of the various challenges that we have faced. During our stakeholder meetings, we made sure to take very detailed notes so we could identify and address any concerns or issues that they raised during the meetings. Um, if we had any really large issues come up during meetings, we would hold a brief discussion amongst ourselves shortly after that meeting in order to brainstorm, delegate any tasks, and figure out the best way to go about addressing this issue if our budget would allow it, if our design would allow it. An example of this sort of process was when one of our stakeholders uh, mentioned the issue of overheating within the socket. That's a very prevalent issue for a lot of prosthetic users and it can lead to either the user rejecting the socket altogether or the user developing many skin issues including ulcers that are extremely painful. After we heard about this issue, we made sure to research it, research its prevalence, and look at different technologies that are used to address things like this in the medical field. From there, we found that the easiest and most budget-friendly way of addressing this was by adding perforations to our socket. The biggest lesson that our group learned throughout the project process was that we should never be afraid to ask for help. There were many times when a team member was faced with a task or an assignment that they were not entirely familiar with, and this task or assignment took them between days and maybe even weeks to accomplish. But it's important to remember that resources do exist, whether it's the internet, professors, fellow colleagues, and textbooks, it's all there to help us out. So when the team member finally asks for help, a task or assignment that usually took between days and weeks turns into just a few hours, and the hours that were saved were put into other parts of the project. This lesson can be applied to industry because there are going to be many times when we are faced with a project or an assignment that we are not entirely familiar with. It's important to remember and utilize the resources that exist in order to finish things in a timely manner as well as still learning for the benefit of ourselves.